let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually have. Right. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it believes is actually in a big piece of that process yeah. that a developer, or let's say, as the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Welcome to this week's Ask an OpenShift Admin live stream. I am co-host Andrew Sullivan, joined as always by my wonderful and amazing co-host. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're co-hosts. Johnny Ricard, right. how are That's you, sir? Right. I'm good, man. How are you? Uh, I can't complain. Um, uh, actually, I'm feeling a little proud of myself. Uh, I think this is the first of the streams that you and I have completely set up by ourselves. Uh, you know, we, we haven't had Stephanie in the background. We haven't had Rohan in the background. And I think I went in and staged everything. Um, as near as I can tell, people are people are watching us. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, well, <laughs> again, welcome. Thank, thanks for joining us. So, yeah, it's um, so a little bit of background there, right? We, we had for a long time, we had a producer, Stephanie, and she was the magic behind the, behind the scenes. So like, getting everything staged so that YouTube and Twitch and all of that other stuff works and that our interface here is, is set up correctly and all that other stuff. And, uh, Johnny and I have done it a couple of times here and there by ourselves, but, um, we, we've always had, you know, adult supervision and yeah, now, now we don't have that. Yeah. She's always, she's always done like the, uh, you know, the, the kicking of the shins underneath the table, making sure that we do the, yeah. know, say the right things and do the right things at the right time. So, yeah. 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 You know, hey, who would have thought that they'd let us kids, you know, run run amok, right? Yeah, yeah. What's that? What's that thing about? Uh, you know, when the when the when the farmer's away, the mice will play, or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyways, anyways. Uh, so I hope everybody's having a good week so far. It's been a uh, a busy week in the world of Kubernetes and the world of OpenShift. Uh, Johnny and I, like, we've both been busy this morning. There was a just a number of things going on. You had a customer meeting. There was a company meeting. Like I've been doing just all kinds of stuff. So it was only like 30 minutes ago, right? You know, just, just before the stream started, we're both like, oh no, what's going on with top of mind? And we came up with the whole list of stuff here. So there, there's lots of stuff going on. In addition to that, today's topic is one that I think is pretty interesting. Um, we, o over the months and years, we've gotten a lot of questions, but more importantly, there's been some confusion about like how worker nodes work with, you know, IPI and UPI deployed clusters, you know, Hey, with, um, in particular, I'll talk with a lot of account teams and customers and they say, Oh, I want IPI. I need IPI. I have to use IPI, but everything they're, they're struggling because they want to deploy and configure IPI in a UPI like way. So I usually ask like IPI is opinionated, right? It wants things a specific way because that's how we make it easy. That's how IPI does its thing. Uh, and, and they say, well, we need the, you know, we, we need the ability to scale worker nodes. We need the ability to use machine sets. Well, you don't need IPI for that. Uh, with on-prem deployments, really, the only difference, the biggest difference between UPI and IPI is the integrated load balancer. So one of the things that we'll be looking at today is how you can use machine sets with UPI to manage worker nodes. Uh, but we'll also look at the inverse, which is how to manually deploy a worker node and join it to an IPI cluster as well. Um, and then, um, Johnny, correct me if I'm talking out of turn here, but I think we'll also be looking at adding worker nodes to single node OpenShift. Yep. So, and I, I know I've only got one of one of those three things. You've got the other two. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, uh, welcome to another, you know, Office Hours live stream here on Red Hat Live Streaming. Um, so my, you know, our usual introduction here is uh, if you have any questions, if there's anything that comes to mind, anything you'd like to talk about, don't hesitate to ask us. Um, so whether you're on chat, um, if you're on social media, right, reach out to us, send us some sort of information or some sort of question. We'll do our best to answer those questions here on the stream. Uh, if we can't answer them during the stream, then we'll follow up either on next week's stream or you can reach out to us um, via the various method methods. Let me find the right thing to click here. So you can reach me at Practical Andrew on social media. So whether it's Twitter, whether it's uh, uh, Reddit or whatever those happen to be, I'm the same across all of those. Um, in addition to, or in addition, we're also in the 
uh, Kubernetes Slack. So it's a great way to reach out and hit not just Johnny and I, but a whole bunch of other people. Uh, and I made a post in that Slack channel, uh, the OpenShift users Slack channel just before this started. You can also reach out via email. Um, so this is also a great way to get a hold of us if you're not watching the stream live. So if you're watching recording, if somebody has directed you to some portion of the uh, stream to learn some information or something like that, don't hesitate to reach out to us with, uh, at, you know, any, any time, whenever you happen to be watching it. Um, so Andrew.Sullivan, simply for me, first name dot last name. I know it's not that way for everybody, but uh, for me, it's Andrew.Sullivan at redhat.com. Uh, you can reach out via email. Also throw Johnny under the bus. Uh, so you can reach Johnny at JRockTX1 on most of the social media. I think you're uh, JRockTX without the one on the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, as well, yeah. Y at RedHat.com. Or you can hit either one of us. Usually, in, anytime somebody sends us an email, we always add the other one. Uh, so you know, if if you only remember one, uh, that's fine too. All right. Um, so I noticed that my chat thing. Is chat, yeah, see, chat's being weird again. Yeah, I can see it coming across on mine. Okay. Um, like I just saw our hope nine's reply, and then it looks like it's catching everything. Okay. So I'll keep an eye on it. It's um, it's wonky sometimes. I've learned. So it's funny because you know behind the scenes, so we're both now in the producer interface, so we can both like change things and click things and make it rearrange and all that other stuff historically we've both been guests and the guest interface is much simpler and much less uh not painful not crowded distracting like I, I can see like multiple views of you and i can see multiple views of myself and all of this other stuff so it's definitely you know my, my ad hd is oh yeah yeah all right uh let's talk about some top of mind stuff um let me bring up our notes document here what have we got going on um, let's see. So a follow up from actually, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, share screen window. I hope you're the window I want. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so a follow up from last week. Uh, so last week we talked about, um, you know, scheduler and kind of ways that we can work with the scheduler, manipulate the scheduler or rescheduling pods and stuff like that. And I talked about how I had a, um, a gist that I was using that I was copying off of and all that other stuff. And I said that I'd share that. So, uh, I, I have actually done that now. Um, uh, so we, I got that published. Um, it's actually been published since last week, but I realized I published it as a secret gist, so nobody could actually find it. <laughs> so, you know, um, but I will go ahead and post the link to this into our chat here. I'll use Twitch, um, just so that way you can distinguish it. Um, so this is all of the stuff that I used last week in order to kind of trigger evictions, trigger out of memory terminations, right? All of those types of things that are inside of that stream. Um, so if anybody's curious, uh, including, uh, you see here I have links into the documentation as well as the uh, sample pod that I was using. Um, so you can see here, this is the, uh, the blog post that we talked about and the pod that we used um, during that particular stream. So lots of good information in there. Hopefully that's helpful to somebody. We'll update the um, YouTube and the other video descriptions to include a link to this gist, as well as I just realized, I don't think I put a link to the YouTube video. No, I didn't um, up here at the top. So I will make at least one edit. Uh, yeah, you can see created seven days ago. It's just been secret the whole time. Yeah, see there, the secret went away because I changed it. All right. Um, let's see what was next on our list of things here. Um, so somebody on Reddit, I think I replied to a thread where they were asking about how to learn OpenShift and how to get started and that type of stuff. And one of the folks um, kind of responded that OpenShift doesn't have developer entitlements. Um, that is simply put, not, not true. Um, so I, and in full disclosure, I didn't know this either until we had two char on the, uh, here on the stream back, like this is 83. It, it was like 50 episodes ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, and Tushar was, was talking about, you know, ways that you can get and try OpenShift and all that. And he mentioned developer entitlements and that was I, I, news to me. Right. Uh, so you can verify this if you'd like for yourself, if you go to, uh, so if we search for Red Hat Appendix 1, 
And if we go here, um, we'll land here, but really we want this page. Oops. Uh, so if we look at this page, this is our license agreement page and all that other stuff. What we want is product appendices and pick whatever your language is for appendix one. This is the one that we care about. And if we scroll down here and we get down to table 1.2, development and production uses. Uh, so you can see here demonstration activities, individual coding and testing activities, both fall under development use for all other Red Hat products, including exhibits 1B, C, and D. Uh, so if we scroll down, keep going here, that was exhibit 1A, we just flew by there, and we get down to exhibit 1B, right? Exhibit 1B includes OpenShift. Let me see if I can find the right table row here. But anyway, so this is just sort of the, yeah, here we go, OpenShift container platform. Um, so this is just sort of the the proof is in the pudding, if you will, um, around no really developer entitlements apply with OpenShift. You can use up to 16 entitlements to deploy a cluster, and you can use that for as long as you like. To uh, you know, there is no option in console.redhat.com to entitle it, um, so it'll stay evaluation. It'll just say expired, but that's perfectly fine because you're using a developer entitlement, and it will still get updates. You can still install operators, all that other stuff. Uh, just keep in mind that it is only for single user non-production use cases. Um, so if Johnny and I are sharing a cluster, that's no longer single user, right? If uh, it magically accidentally turns into a production cluster, um, not that uh, that ever happens, right, Johnny? Mm -hmm. ever. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's no longer a uh, developer cluster, right? It's no longer in, uh, eligible for the developer entitlements. But so, yeah, that... Uh, just keep that in mind. Again, uh, OpenShift absolutely included inside of there. I also always recommend to folks, if you go to try.openshift.com, it takes you to this landing page. Um, so this will walk you through all the different trials and all the different things that are available. Uh, so I usually send folks to, um, to here. It, it doesn't include or it doesn't highlight the developer entitlements. Um, you have to go through the self-managed and then you can go through that way. But um it's a great place to get started and start uh, start on the journey, so to speak. So managed services are especially fun. I, you know, do the the Rosa CLI, and it's like one command, assuming you have all the permissions, right? It's one command yeah. to stand up a cluster. It's great. Yeah, it's a lot like, I, I like how they did that too. It's a lot like setting up an EKS or AKS, you know, it's just a couple things yeah. and you're done. All right. Um, let's see. What other top of mind stuff do we have in here? ArgoCon. Um, what's happening with ArgoCon? I yeah, it's, just, it's, it's going on this week. And, um, you know, our, our old teammate, Christian, he's out there uh, representing. Uh, you know, he's doing – I was trying to find the link to his talk, but um, I'm sure it will pop up on LinkedIn. So if I see it, I'll, I'll put it in the, in the uh, YouTube comments. But, yeah, he's out there. So if, if you're watching online or if you're going to watch some of the scenes, make sure you check out Christian's stuff because, uh, you know, he's always putting out a lot of good information about GitOps. That's so and I guess that's probably why he's not in chat right now. Yeah, probably. Or maybe he'll maybe he's gonna be late. You know, maybe he's got one hand on, one hand off kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, conferences are not an excuse. I I stream from a conference. Come on, I know, Christian. I know. <laughs> you you set the bar. So. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, there was one other thing. Oh, not really one other thing. Just a reminder of stuff that's coming up. Um, so uh, as is tradition, right, just a reminder, uh, uh, hopefully a gentle reminder to subscribe on whatever platform you're watching us on, because we do have a ton of content that's coming up. Uh, so confirmed topics, like things that we actually know are happening over the next three weeks. Uh, so next week, September 28th, we'll be talking about hosted control planes, aka Hypershift with Adele Zalouk. Uh, so it's a really interesting one, right, using a cluster to host in containers the control planes for other clusters. Uh, so you can, you know, it, it's a resource optimization thing. It's a speed to deployment thing, right? There's lots of really cool stuff that's happening there. Um, I think that one will be interesting, especially for any customers who are, have, you know, more than a handful of clusters. Um, you know, use ACM, you can deploy those um, quickly, easily. You can apply policy-based configuration. I'm not gonna talk all through this. We're gonna be talking about it next week. 
Uh, let's see the week after that, October 5th, uh, we'll be talking about pod auto scaling changes that have happened, um, in 4.11, 4.10, uh, in particular the alternative recommender. Uh, so this was a new one to me. Um, right. So pod, pod auto scaling works off of a recommendation engine and you can create and use a different recommender to determine when it should actually trigger an auto scaling event. Now note, this is not the same thing as Kida, right? So Kida, uh, if we go to uh, Kida, Kida.io, Kida.io, that is a random website, <laughs> Kida.sh, there we go. Um, so Kida is events-driven auto-scaling. So this is one where like it'll plug into, I think, uh, we have tech preview support for it right now, or support tech. Tech preview isn't actually supported, but tech preview integration where it'll hook into like Prometheus. So you can say, hey, if this civic metric for Prometheus is is uh, exceeds a, a value or is below a value, do something. Uh, so the alternative recommend, recommender, um, that's one of the things that we'll be covering is why, why is that different? How is that different from Kita? Uh, October 12th, we'll be talking about composable OpenShift. This is another interesting one, especially for folks who are interested in um, deploying a subset of the core OpenShift services. Um, so what I mean here is if you're familiar with the cluster version operator, right? Anytime you do an OC git CO, uh, I've got a cluster up here, OC git CO. Uh, so all of these things. Let's say that maybe I don't want to deploy the marketplace. Right. Today, you don't have an option. You get the marketplace, whether you want it or not. Composable OpenShift uh, means that we can make some modifications to these things inside of here, some of these things inside of here. Uh, so we'll be talking about that um, in three weeks' time. Uh, after that, it gets a little bit fuzzier, but we do know that we won't be on the air the week of the last week of October. Uh, I think that's October 26th uh, because that's KubeCon. So. There'll be tons and tons and tons. I think I saw a list of sessions that are being done by Red Hatters there, and it's like 60. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, it's massive. Yeah, and, and you know, it's KubeCon. If you've never done or attended or, or viewed virtually KubeCon, um, they aren't really vendor sessions. It's not, hey, here's how Red Hat OpenShift does something better than everybody else. Rather, it's all of our folks who are working upstream um, talking about the stuff that's going on upstream and with all their various projects. So... Definitely, um, you know, we always take that opportunity, not just for Johnny and I to uh, catch a breath because, you know, we're, we're used to doing this every week, so it's not a big deal, but rather because there's so much good content that's there that we, we just really encourage folks to go and check that out. And I think that was it. I think that was everything. Um, yeah. Top of mind. There we go. Done. We did it. It almost feels like normal. Uh, let's see. Anything in chat here? Um, uh, our hope nine is saying that we should get promoted. Oh, uh, got got promoted. Um, I oh, think, got promoted. Yeah, yeah I think Sorry. I think that means to uh, the uh, Red Red Hat YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Our hope nine. Um, we we try to update the calendar, um, but honestly, it, it's. Um, it's on my list of things to do. And sometimes we forget. So this morning I sat down, I don't know, you, you probably can't see that this is anything other than a yellow square. These are the like eight things that we do for each one of the, uh, each one of the streams. So, you know, create a post on Twitter, create a post on LinkedIn, which I don't think we did today. Uh, create a post on Reddit, uh, post in the Kubernetes Slack, post to the internal lists, right? Update the streaming count. Like there's just all of these things that, um, as we're, we're, we're learning and we're getting better. Um, hopefully we'll um, be more consistent with those things. So mea culpa, if you will. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk about today's topic. Um, so as I said at the beginning, uh, you know, worker nodes are they're a thing, right? Uh, everybody has worker nodes. Everybody needs worker nodes. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to say worker nodes but worker node doesn't just mean um, a, a, a node that is hosting your applications. It can also mean infra nodes, right? Things that are hosting core infrastructure services. It can also mean, you know, other types of, of customized nodes. 
Uh, one thing that I think surprises some people is you don't, you're not limited to just three node types, right? Control plane, infra, worker. Um, you can actually have as many different types, as many different labels as you like. Um, so for example, I can have, you know, an infra node type that is specific for, you know, maybe in ingest or uh, ingress rather. Um, you know, I can have one that's specific for ODF. If I'm using OpenShift Data Foundation, I can have, you know, specific for um, I don't know, metrics and logging, right? So I, I, you can divide those up if you so choose. They don't have to all be one. So long as they're not hosting applications, they are considered infra. Um, although I think the tools that we use on the back end do make it easier from a reporting standpoint to identify which ones need entitlements and which one don't, if they, so long as they have an infra tag um, or an infra label on the node. But it doesn't have to just be infra. It can be infra and worker and something else as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, worker nodes, compute nodes, right? Nodes in general are something that we almost always deploy, you know, and need as a part of the cluster. So I'm going to start with UPI. Um, so if we have, if we look at our clusters here, so let's see, get node. Um, so I deployed this cluster. This is a vSphere UPI cluster. Um, I deployed it as a compact cluster. Um, to be clear, that is not something that is officially supported. Um, so uh, officially, I believe that compact clusters, so a compact cluster is one that is deployed with only three nodes, where all three nodes are both control plane and workers. Um, officially, it is only supported to deploy a new cluster with that uh, model if it is a non-integrated or a platform equals none, none cluster. Um, it does, as you can see, work. Officially, if you wanted to have a three node vSphere integrated cluster, you would want to deploy standard cluster, so five nodes, and then basically mark the control plane as schedulable after deployment and then remove the worker nodes and then you'd end up with the same sort of config. But I skipped that process because I'm a rule breaker I don't, because I don't need I, I don't need my cluster to be supported, so um, or my install process to be supported. So just anyways, just be aware of that. And if we want to look um, just for the sake of informational purposes, let's do uh, what my install config look like. So you can see control plane replicas three, compute replicas zero. Um, and then after that, I kind of, I just did a standard deployment. Um, so over here is my vCenter. You can see I've got my three nodes running inside of here. Here's my bootstrap, which is currently powered off. Uh, I did the normal things to deploy the cluster. So if we look at, uh, uh, my configuration script here. Um, so all this is, this is a very simple shell script that I use. Um, so I, I just use go VC. Uh, in order to go in and configure each one of my nodes with the appropriate settings. So here, attach the ignition config onto here, um, set the ignition config base or uh, encoding rather, set the static IP that I wanted to use for this, and then do the normal enable UID for each one of the nodes. Um, so straightforward, here's all of my static IP information that's up here. Um, so this is all in inside the, uh, VPN inside of Red Hat stuff. All right, so we'll get out of that. So standard cluster, um, that's everything. That's, uh, that's all I got running inside of here. And like any, um, I guess the last part of that is like any UPI, it is using an external load balancer. So I just have a HA proxy deployed on my Bastion host and that acts as my, uh, my load balancer. So it's UPI, like really trust me, it's UPI. Um, so let's look at our cluster. So we can see here, this is our blue cluster, um, which is the one that we were just looking at. And we can see that the infrastructure provider is vSphere. So this is really important. When I deploy IPI, the way that the installation process works is effectively OpenShift install. So the command line utility that we use will use the credentials that are in the install config.yaml. It will connect to vCenter it will upload a CoreOS template image, and it will use that in order to create our control plane VMs and uh, and our bootstrap VM. So it goes through and you know 
bootstrap happens, it hands over to the control plane, the control plane takes over, and then the control plane creates, or, or I guess the installer, creates a machine set. And then it scales that machine set to, I think the default is three, but it would be whatever number of replicas are specified in your install config.yaml. And that's how the initial set of worker nodes get created. So at the end of an IPI install, I have a control plane with three nodes, and I have a machine set that has been scaled to however many worker nodes are specified. And that's how the cluster gets deployed. With UPI, OpenShift install doesn't do any of that. Instead, we generate the ignition configs, and then me as the administrator, I go in, and as we saw in my script there, right, I provisioned each one of these virtual machines. I configured it with the CPU and memory that I wanted. I attached the ignition files using the standard methodology. So if we were to go here to look at the settings, edit configuration, so we can see here is our, where to go? Anyway, somewhere inside of here, there's our IP, static IP config information. Here's our base 64. I don't know where it's at in here. Anyways, all, all of that information is attached just like the installer would do with IPI. I turn on my nodes, I let them boot, I let the cluster deploy, and at the end of that, I have an OpenShift, a UPI cluster. So how is this different? Let me find the right window here. Uh, so a couple of things. So one, if I look at my compute and go to nodes, we can see that I only have three nodes here, just like we saw on the command line. My machines, though, you'll notice, they're all, while they're present, they're all failed. Uh, and this is because that integration, you know, that what the uh, machine API does to provision and control those doesn't apply with control plane nodes in particular. However, recently, OpenShift has begun creating a machine set out of the box. I don't know when this started, um, but historically that hasn't been there. So I was kind of surprised when I was getting ready for the stream to see that this, this guy was actually there. And if we look at it, it actually has all of the configuration that we need, right? You can see here, memory, CPU, disk, all of the stuff. So this may work right out of the box. I haven't tested it because again, I don't think that this is, um, I don't think that this was there in previous versions. I think the last time I looked at this was 4.9 and it wasn't there. So I, I'm assuming it was recent. So instead what we're gonna do is we're going to create our own machine set. Um, just a couple of other things here. So you can see there's no auto scaler configured. Health checks are there just like they always are. And my normal set of machine configs. So let's create a machine set. So we'll get rid of the help over here just to make it a little bit bigger and able to be seen. So I've already created this. I'm just going to copy it over from my um, notes document here. And then we'll walk through what this file actually looks like. So as with all things, right, we start with all things Kubernetes. We start with our, our object. So I'm creating a machine set. I give it a name. Uh, you can see there's a bit of important information here, that being what is our uh, uh, infrastructure name? Oh, I guess I should start with the docs. Um, here we go. So creating a machine set on vSphere. Um, let me copy this and paste it into right here. So I'm gonna paste a link to the docs in case anybody wants to follow along. Um, so it, the docs here go over in an overview. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sample YAML machine set for a custom resource uh, on vSphere. And it walks through all of these different options and everything that's available in here in the normal way that the docs does. It also walks through all of the permissions that you'll need. Um, so remember, this set of permissions will need to match the same that is assigned to a, a, a service account in vCenter that you would need for an IPI um, cluster. Additionally, you still have all of the prerequisites for worker nodes, for nodes that are provisioned from a machine set that match IPI. So for example, DHCP still required. Right? You can't do static IP configuration with a machine set or a node that's provisioned via machine set. 
Uh, so that's important and why we wanted to talk about how to add manually provisioned nodes to an IPI cluster, because maybe you do have some things that you want to have a static IP. Well, that's how you would do it. Um, so in this instance, everything else is configured with a static IP, um, but these new nodes will rely on DHCP. Um, and then beyond that, it's just the normal stuff inside the docs. So let's talk about our, our object here. All right, so we give it a name. Uh, so we need to know this infrastructure name. Um, in theory, you already created that when you deployed the IPI cluster. Uh, so you saw here, I have this in a folder that is named after that infrastructure name. If we look in the installation docs, vSphere installing on a cluster, where is it? Installing a cluster on vSphere with user provision infrastructure. So it's a JQ command. Uh, so extracting the infrastructure name is the section of the install documents that we want here. And it tells us exactly how to do that. And then if we were to follow along down in the docs here, it tells us that, hey, you need to create a folder inside of vSphere to hold your virtual machines so that storage provisioning and all that other stuff works. So we, we should already have that information and we want to include it in the name of our machine set. Stop being overly helpful. Those pop-ups, they get in the way. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. So, yep, machine API, we want to make sure it's there. Blah, blah, blah. So if you're following along over here, right, I'm just walking down through here, right? You can see role and infrastructure ID and infrastructure ID dash role. So I've just filled out all of that information here. So you'll note here that I'm giving it a role, quote unquote, not of worker or infra or anything like that. I'm just calling it AOA. Again, that name is arbitrary. Down below, so now I'm in the spec and so remember the way that this works is this is the machine set. This is the spec for the machine set, right? So, oops, again, overly helpful, gets in the way. And then once we get into the template is where this is what turns into the machine template that it, that gets used. So anything below here is what we'll see reflected in the machine's definition when it's created. So down here, when I create this metadata label, this is the label that will be applied to any nodes that are created. Not this, this is a metadata label, not a, or a, a metadata label on the template, but not on the machine. Man, that's hard to describe. Uh, so this is the important one. If you wanted it to be an infra node, right, we would just add infra. If you wanted it to be, you know, a, uh, ODF node, right? We can add those as needed. Uh, so down here, the provider spec. So one thing that I've found that's a little, um, I'll, I'll say irritating, is there is no way to figure out what these are easily. So the provider spec is specific to each infrastructure that you're deploying the machine set onto. And it has, you can see with you know vSphere here, things like the number of CPUs, the number of cores per socket, the amount of memory, the disk assigned to it, and all that. So while the docs, and if we switch back over to the docs here, right, the docs walk through and they tell you what some of these things are, but they don't tell us a lot about each one of those and what it means. And as far as I can tell, it's not in the docs at all. Um, so instead, I looked it up in GitHub. Um, so I'll post this link into Twitch as well. Uh, so if we look at this particular page in GitHub, what we see is the definition, the API definition of that machine, vSphere machine provider spec. So switching back over here, here's our vSphere machine provider spec object type, right? So I can walk down through here and again, I get, and it's a little bit frustrating. You know, I, I sort of understand Go, not well, um, but you can walk through and see the comments in the code here to understand what each one of these is. So sometimes people will ask things like, oh, can I have more than one network adapter attached to my machine set provisioned virtual machines? Um, with vSphere, yes. Um, so you can see here with network, right? So it's a network spec object. I scroll down here to find network spec, you can see it is an array of devices. 
So if I switch back over here and find my network devices, this is the first element in the array, network name, and then the name of that device. If I had more than one network that I wanted to attach it to, I would simply put more than one of these in here. It, and it will iterate over those and it will add one for each one of those defined networks, add a network adapter for each one of those networks. On the other hand, if we look at things like, oh, I want to add more than one disk drive to, you know, di disks to each one of my nodes. If we look up here at disk gigabytes, you can see it's just an int, right? So there's only one value that's available there. I cannot specify multiple disks um, for better or for worse. Um, anyways, you can you can look through all of these docs or um, comments, I guess, in the code in order to figure out what, you, what each one represents if you have any questions. Um, one thing that is kind of important, the snapshot, depending on how savvy and, and how important it is to your vSphere team, uh, maybe check out the difference between a full clone and the uh, linked clones. Um, they do have some implications uh, on particularly on the storage side. I would say most of the time we want to leave it at the default of a full clone, uh, but just check with your vSphere admins if you have any questions there. So walking down through here, um, one important thing that was also added is this snapshot. So I can specify a template VM name as well as a specific snapshot on that template VM that I want to use if I so choose. Um, other than that, everything else, so this workspace stuff, all of this was inherited or, or pulled from the existing integrations. So let's roll back a little bit. So one, when we deploy the cluster, or so when we deploy the cluster, it asks for, with UPI, it still asks for all of the VMware questions, right? It asks for what's the vCenter endpoint? What's the username? What's the password? What's the folder that you want to deploy to? What's the data store? What's the network, right? It always asks those questions, whether you're doing UPI or IPI. With UPI, it's okay if those don't work. The cluster will still deploy, It'll still, right, it, you, you'll still have a fully functioning cluster at the end of it. Well, you'll, you'll have a mostly functioning cluster at the end of it, I should say. What won't work is the integrations. So it'll deploy, it'll say vSphere integrated, all that other stuff. But what you'll have is um, up here in the overview, I'm gonna open a new tab so I don't have to lose any changes I made there. What you'll have is alerts that are firing from the vSphere problem detector, you know, saying that, hey, the credentials aren't right, or it can't do this, or this isn't working, or, you know, all of that type of stuff. So we want to be aware of, we want to be, um, uh, we need to make sure that the credentials have, are correct, the configuration is correct, and I can actually utilize the vSphere integrations. If it doesn't work, and again with UPI, it will deploy if it doesn't work, then provisioning machine sets won't work. If you need to change that, um, I've got a bookmark for this. Um, if it doesn't work, there is a KCS, come on browser, that describes how to go in and change those. Uh, so that KCS, I don't think I'm logged in. No, I'm not. So it won't actually show us, but that KCS, um, walks through how to modify that configuration. So go in and edit the vSphere.conf. Um, it'll push out to all of the nodes. I think it will cause a node reboot for any nodes that are there. So just FYI, because it has to lay the file out and then Kublet uses that file to do the integration. So it will trigger a reboot. Sorry, I got a, I got a tickle. I got this. <laughs> when I talk a lot, apparently it causes me to cough. Uh, Daniel Norris, did you already address how you got dark mode? Um, yeah. Not on this stream, but we did talk about it in one of the other ones. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. If you go to user preferences, so theme system default. So I'm using a uh, Mac. My, my system theme is dark all the time, uh, but you can change it right in here if you so choose. So pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, 4.11 4 is where that was implemented. Um, yeah, I see. Johnny, I think you said that. Yep. All right. So, uh, yeah. 
let me recollect my thoughts here. Um, so you need to make sure that the vSphere credentials and everything are configured and ready and work. Again, vSphere Problem Detector will alert you if that's not happening. Uh, and then the other thing is, if you were watching a moment ago, you saw I talked about how there is a template. And we need to have this template available inside of our environment. So I've already uploaded one in here. Um, I'll just upload another one just to show you what it's like. Uh, so I want to deploy an OVF template. Um, so all I did here, I go to mirror.openshift.com. Uh, you can also go through the uh, regular customer portal, access.redhat.com, and go through the process of finding and downloading. Dependencies, CoreOS 4.11, latest. Oh, that's interesting. Latest took me to 4.11.0, but 4.11.2 is in here. Huh. We'll use this one. Um, so I just downloaded this OVA and I uploaded it because I don't trust the internet. Um, I uploaded it to a web server that's running inside of the uh, environment. Go to remember the IP address that I used here. There we go. Uh, so, yeah. Oh. See that one? I clicked the same thing yesterday and I didn't notice it apparently. So we'll copy the link address for our OVA here. I'm going to provide that into here. We'll call this um, blue dash house. Let's give it a different name. Select a compute resource. We'll use the cluster. I think this step takes so long because this is when it actually like pulls down more information to get better metadata about what needs to happen with the uh, OVA deployment. I've never understood why this step takes longer. Is the OKD UI like this? Uh, yes, it's very similar. Um, Branding and stuff like that is going to be different. So instead of saying like Red Hat OpenShift, it'll say OKD. Um, but it, it should be almost exactly the same. Where'd my vSphere cluster go? Uh, so template details, yep. We don't need to change anything here. Um, so the, like we don't need to set CPU, we don't need to set memory. All of that is determined by the machine set spec. What could be important here is the data store as well as the virtual disk format. So you'll notice that there is no place to specify whether I want I want whether or not I want my VM to have a thick or thin disk. It inherits that from the template that it uses here. So if I specify thin here, then any worker nodes that are created from this template will also have a thin provision disk. Additionally, the the data store that I use here might or might not be important. It depends on your storage and it depends on how it does um, clones across data stores. So for example, if I deploy this template into this OSC3 VMware data store, but then over here, I specify, uh, where's the data store? Uh, data store. So if I specify this AOS vSphere data store, what's gonna happen is it will clone across data stores. With most storage in vSphere, there is no offloading of that, right? It'll have to do a full, like a copy of that actual template. Now, fortunately, the disk is only a gigabyte or something in size, but if you want to use offloaded clones, you know, Vasa and all that other stuff, make sure that it's in the same data store that you intend to provision the VMs from. So network, this again doesn't matter because we're setting it in the, in the spec. We don't need to set these things uh, because that'll be set by machine API and we can click finish. And then what we should see is it'll go through and it'll deploy that. So we're calling this blue Arcos. So I will change that in my machine set. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So you can see credential secret. So this is standard. This is the same credential secret that'll get created during install time. We don't need to modify that. Number of CPUs, however many you want. I want two. I only want two CPUs. Number of cores per socket. Um, 
I think the default is almost always one for this. Um, it does have some NUMA implications, I think, um, but use whatever works best for you or whatever the vSphere admins say. Amount of memory to assign to the VM, the size of the disk to use for the VM. You can see I'm going with all minimums here because my environment is resource constrained. Whatever the network we want to use, again, you can have more than one there. The template to clone the virtual machine from, because this is a machine set created with UPI, that template won't be there by default. You will have to upload and create that template VM. It doesn't have to be marked as a template. It can be a regular VM or it can be a template, um, but you will have to upload that, whereas IPI does that automatically. Uh, user data secret, this should be the same. It's just inherited um, from all of the others. And then the workspace, you can see that all of this information comes from uh, install config, which gets put into the vSphere.conf, which is where it gets that data from. Uh, if it's not right there, then you just need to update it here. or you, And some of it you can change. So if you wanted to use a different data store. Um, I think you can technically change like the data center and the folder and stuff like that. I don't think it's supported though. Um, do you need an on-premises cluster to set up OKD? No, you can use um, uh, AWS, you can use Azure, right? All of those just like with uh, uh, OpenShift. If you go to docs.okd.io, it has all of the instructions for how to deploy um, into the various hyperscalers. All right, so let's create our machine set. Uh, hopefully this guy's done by now. Yep. So create the machine set. That's it, super simple. Um, so now let's create a virtual machine. So real quick, you can see I've only got, still got the same three nodes that are over here. Um, Bootstrap, which we're not gonna use. This is one of our templates, the original one that I created yesterday. Um, when I was testing, this is the one that we just now uploaded. So we'll increase our machine count to one, click save. And now we can look at a couple of different things. So one, I can go to machines. You can see that we have a new machine that is being provisioned. So it followed the naming template that we provided inside of the machine set. So you can see it has AOA in the name. So we see our machine set here has zero of one machines. If I flip over to vSphere, you can see that I now have a brand new virtual machine that was created. I wonder if it shows in here. I don't know if it shows where it was cloned from. Yeah, there we go. So here it says blue dash Arcos clone to blah, 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 blah. So we can basically prove through the event log here that it did use this VM as a template. And now we're just waiting for it to boot and do its thing. So it'll go through the process. Yeah, so it's booting up. It's getting all the stuff that it needs. Uh, so it'll go through the process just like with IPI. And eventually we'll have a node that is, it reports as provision as uh, not just provisioned, but joined to the cluster. And it'll show up in the nodes over here. It won't show up yet. It won't. That's the last last step of it joining the cluster and doing all that stuff. So. Can you use this to move a, a whole cluster to a new VMware data store? Yes. Um, so that is one of the things that we, one of the ways that, that you can do that. So effectively create a new machine set with a new data store, provision new nodes into that new data store, and then remove nodes from the original one. Um, where that gets iffy is with control plane nodes. Uh, so control plane nodes, today cannot be managed via machine set. So instead you would have to do effectively a, uh, a basically a fail, right? you, you would manually fail and remove a control plane node, provision a new virtual machine in the new data store, and then do a recovery of that, of that uh, control plane node that was removed. Um, and we did a live stream on that a while ago. It's also in the docs, uh, if you look in the docs. Um, Somewhere down here, back up and, back up and restore, um, control plane, and then replacing it on LVHCD member. Basically, you follow this process. So that is one of the ways that you can do it. Um, I think that is usually the um, default suggestion, even though, if I'm being honest, that way sucks. Um, if, if it's an option to shut down the cluster, 
that might work as well. So I say might uh, because where it gets weird, if you will, is if you're using PVCs that are provisioned using the VMware entry or CSI provisioner, those don't move. So, and if they do move, it breaks them. So this is why if you do like a storage migration, uh, it's not a live migration, it's a offline storage migration between data stores. You want to make sure that the node is shut down so that no PVCs are mounted because normally a storage view motion would take all of the attached disks with it to the new data store. We don't want that. Um, so yeah, you, you will have to, if you do need to decommission a data store and that data store is being used for PVCs, you'll have to use something like the migration toolkit for containers and work with the app teams to move that data across. Just be aware of that. Um, but yeah, other than that, it, it would work absolutely for what you're suggesting there. Um, and in fact, especially, I, I would suggest if you're just changing the storage for uh, the worker nodes, I would definitely suggest that. Um, I think that's it. Uh, at this point, we're just kind of sitting, waiting for this thing to provision and do its thing, and it'll eventually show up and join the cluster and be available to host workload, just like with any other IPI machine set type of thing. Um, yeah, I feel like I went way long in that, Johnny. Sorry. No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, yeah, so the the next two things that we're going to talk about, like one is going to be adding a, um, a node into a cluster. And um, so I thought that this would be a lot easier on AWS. <laughs> it actually is. And so, uh, yeah, it's not going to go well. But um, you, you always say that. But by the way, I'll interject real quickly to point out that, uh, you know, how I was making those changes on the fly. Look, it showed up with all the roles that I added in there when it actually joined. Oh yeah. Nice. So yeah, it's nice when a plan comes together, right? That's right. Yeah. Right. And, and Mehdi, uh, I think I'm saying your name, right? Hopefully, hopefully I'm saying your name, right? The, we called it Bonanza just because we, we couldn't think of anything good and professional to say besides Bonanza. So that's, that's kind of what, what we came up with. No. So I, I did, um, you know, we, we try to be cognizant of language differences and all that. So I did actually do a quick search of what is the definition of bonanza, just to make sure that there isn't something that I was unaware of. So you can see a, a source of great wealth or prosperity or a rich mine vein or pocket of ore. So it is a, um, it is a valid word, not just a TV show from the 1970s here in the U S. Um, anyways, Something that is very valuable. I like to think that Johnny and I are very valuable, right? Maybe, maybe a little bit of hubris in there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Mostly valuable. Yeah, not not entirely unvaluable. How's that? <laughs> yeah, Medi. Med yeah, it's um. Anytime you Google Bonanza, like if without also definition, it's you'll find references to the TV show. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, Johnny. No, you're good. You're good. So, um, you know, part of this is like, we wanted to talk about, you know, we have single node open shift and now we can actually add worker nodes to um, a single node open shift cluster. And so let me, let me grab this link. Uh, I have like a billion links open, so. I don't, know what, I don't know what that's like. I know it's, I'm, I, I feel like I want to say I'm better than this, but I'm not, I like, it's just, it's, it's a mess. Um, okay, so let me paste this. Um, but yeah, so essentially you want to, you, you add your single node cluster using the assisted installer. Um, and so just, I guess I could quickly walk through that. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, awesome, oops. And um, yeah, so if you go, if you go into clusters, you can actually do uh, create cluster and then data center, and then you can just click on create cluster again. And then, you know, just give it like a, a, you know, a name, you know, so demo cluster and then whichever OpenShift version that you'd like. And then you just select the install single node OpenShift. And then you can do some static network configuration. So if you, if you, you still need DHCP, but if you want to assign some static IPs uh, to your node when it comes up, then you can do that. Just know that if you have two or more interfaces that are on the same VLAN and they're both coming up with the same IP, it's, it's going to, uh, when it's doing its checks, it's going to fail. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, but they, then, yeah. So, they fixed oh, no, it, it was doing it this morning. 
Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you have two, yeah, two, two adapters on the same subnet and yeah, it'll, it'll cause an error and the error is very non specific. <laughs> yes. Anyways, sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, so then essentially what will happen is you'll create that and then you get to a point where you can either download an ISO for, um, you know, like a virtual media. So like, say if you have a server, you can connect the virtual media and then do the remote install, or you can download the full installation ISO that has all the stuff with it and um, install your single node that way. And that's essentially what I did. So I installed that first single node instance with um, the, the ISO. And what happens is after a while, it goes through the deployment and then you get this nice interface within the assisted installer that has all of your stuff. And so now we want to add a host to the single node cluster. Now, something to keep in mind with this is even though you're adding workers, you're not actually adding high availability or distribute, you know, like you're, you're not distributing the uh, core components or the control plane across the worker nodes. You, you're literally just adding worker nodes. So think of this, if you're used to Kubernetes, right? You have a single Kubernetes control plane and then you add a worker node to it. You're not adding any HA, you're just adding a worker. Um, so same concept. And the the other thing with the the worker nodes is that they don't, they don't have to have the same requirements from a, uh, a compute resource perspective, right? I think it's two vCPUs or one physical CPU and a, I believe it's like eight gigs of RAM and 100 gigs of storage. So it's significantly smaller than what you would need for a single node OpenShift, which is eight cores and 15 gigs by default to use the assisted installer uh, interface. And Snow, okay. Snow still requires a non-integrated install, right? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, it, I, well, so you, you can do some VMware integration. It, it's, let me see if I can find it. They had the thing for VMware today. I, I mean, I, I think it'll... I think it'll offer you the option, but I don't know if it if we support it or not. Um, Nageshwar, yes, um, you would need to have you would need to entitle those additional worker nodes. Um, so, I, anyways, assuming it's a non-integrated install, you know, with single node OpenShift, you can add those worker nodes on different infrastructures. So maybe my first, you know, my single node OpenShift was deployed to you know, a physical server, uh, you know, I can add a worker node that's hosted in vSphere or, you know, uh, Hyper-V or whatever, right? Uh, because Hyper-V is a supported hypervisor for OpenShift. Mm -hmm. um, so y you do have that option, at least in order to do that. Um, it doesn't have to be on the same platform or the same infrastructure type. Yep. So long as it's a non-integrated install. Gotcha. Yep. And so, so this was a, it was just a bare metal. So I, I used my Dell server and um, yeah, so we installed this now to add another machine to this cluster. Um, I need to go back over here and then I would just click add host. So if you see, I'm in my, the clusters interface, and then I just selected my cluster that I created and then you just click on add host. And then again, you just download this, uh, um, ISO, and then you would mount it into a virtual media. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing this one. So Medias um, is single node OpenShift a new offering from Red Hat? It's not new. It's uh, the the workers with single single node OpenShift is new. I think I think 4.9 it went tech preview or 4.8 tech preview something like was, that. Four, yeah, it was 4.8 or. 4.8, 4 I think it was tech or dev preview. 4.9 was GA, maybe in a version earlier in there. But so if single node OpenShift is like literally it's OpenShift, like full OpenShift, just in a single a single node, as the name implies. Um, so there are some modifications to reduce um, like resources to be an appropriate size for a single node cluster. Um, so think things like it will turn down the resource requirements associated with Prometheus um, or requests, I should say. Um, so that way more resources are available to applications because it doesn't need to account for a cluster that could be, sorry, there's a bug flying right in front of my face. Um, it, you know, it doesn't need to have enough CPU and memory for Prometheus to uh, accommodate, you know, hundreds of nodes and tens of thousands of pods, that type of stuff. But yeah, to Johnny's point, um, adding worker nodes is new in 4.11. Yeah. And so 
Uh, don't make fun of me because I'm using Windows here, but that's because I had to have Java and I didn't want to deal with Java on Linux. So I installed a Windows machine this morning. Why, why, why do iLOMs always use like ancient versions of Java? Dude, and, and Dell has done it. Like they've essentially converted everything to iDrag or uh, HTML5. And um, you're like, oh, okay, that's awesome. It just works. So then, yeah, Super Micro, they're still using Java. And it's a giant pain in the butt to try and get this to work on Linux. And so, you know, here we are. It's, it, let me guess, it's like Java 5 or something, you know? Java 8. So nice, nice oh, and okay. just yeah, gross. Slightly, slightly better than, you know, Java 5, Java 6, but still ancient. Yep. So, yeah. So, essentially, you take that ISO and then you mount it into your virtual media, which is what I'm doing here. Um, this just takes forever. And then um, what will eventually happen is we'll just boot from that ISO and then the machine will reboot and then it starts its discovery. And so we'll start seeing some of the um, the metrics from the machine coming in. So the number of CPUs, we'll see the number of, or the amount of RAM, the amount of disks, interfaces and stuff like that. Um, and then essentially you just create install cluster or install node. And um, th it won't work here because of the way that my home internet is. So I can't actually modify DNS, so it can't actually find it. But the idea is the same. You just click create cluster. As long as it can talk to DNS, um, then everything will be fine. And uh, yeah. Mehdi, um, so it, it is heavier than code ready workspaces or what do we call that? OpenShift local now. OpenShift local, yeah. Yeah. Um, because OpenShift local slash CRW does not include some features, functions, capabilities of OpenShift um, because the expectation is it's just for developer use cases and stuff like that. So they just like fully remove some things. So I think Code Ready Workspaces is four CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM. Yeah. In the default config, whereas single node OpenShift is eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. Yeah. I missed the, uh, the boot menu. So, yeah, here we are. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, you went back through assisted installer and yep. basically selected the add a node option and um, had it generate an ISO. So, it, it'll boot to the ISO. Does it pop into the assisted installer interface or does it just automatically join the cluster? So it, it'll pop into the interface like the normal machines do. And then you have to click um, install, you know, so okay. it's, it's essentially just like doing the, um, the assistant installer, but you're just adding it into the existing uh, single node cluster. Okay. And you have to do like, uh, I guess I should have mentioned this before, just like with IPI and machine, anytime you use machine sets, like when I was doing that with you, with my UPI cluster um, using machine set to add nodes, I didn't have to approve CSRs. Do you have to approve CSRs with single node OpenShift and assisted installer adding a node? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's no metal. And yeah, apparently this thing disconnects. So, JB Pratt, you're right. Code Ready Containers is the um, the old name for OpenShift Local. Code Ready Workspaces is the integrated IDE offering with OpenShift. Uh, Medi, yep, you cannot. I mean, if you have a really large laptop, you could run it like res resource, yeah. high, high resource spec. Uh, for what it's worth, it's uh, it, it is a issue or thing that we encounter here at Red Hat as well, right? My like my laptop is, uh, I don't know, it's an Intel eighth gen, I think, but, and it has thirty two gigs of RAM, so it, it struggles to run code ready workspaces when I want to do something locally. Um, yeah, and, and the thing about the code or the OpenShift local is that you can override the defaults, um, but just know that you're going to take a performance hit because everything's on that on that config. So um, you know your control plane of worker and everything is there, so it, it will take a hit. Yeah, uh, Christopher, can you build storage classes? I assume you mean with code ready containers. Um, yes, I think so, um, but it wouldn't be able to mount external storage unless the VM that it creates is connected directly to the outside world. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about code ready containers or OpenShift local to know how that works, but it, it, I mean, in theory, right. It's, it's a real OpenShift just with some things removed, but um, storage does work from what I remember. Um, it's just, if it's running 
on a bridged network behind NAT on your laptop, then like you wouldn't have a way of mounting that so far as I know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah. Now I feel like I should go and test it. <laughs> All right, so this is going to take a little bit to check in. But yeah, so essentially the the machine will start checking in. And then if we go back and we look at our console again, uh, we'll see the node here. It'll pop up and it'll have all of its specs. And so then um, it, it goes through a set of tests that it runs to make sure that the host is going to, um, that it, it, it makes it sure that the host will, you know, is valid. And um, once that's done, there'll be a little button over here and you just click install node and then it'll go through and it'll do its installation. And then it'll be part of the single node cluster. So after yeah. you approve some CSRs. Yeah, I, I think the important part, you know, that we talked about is you don't add worker nodes in the same way that you would with like a UPI or, or, right. or another cluster, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't go and install core OS and you know point it at the ignition file and do all that other stuff. Rather you use assisted installer and have it generate the ISO and add it that way. It's it's a much simpler process. Um, yeah, it's super easy. Mehdi, uh, no, Johnny uses Fedora, I think, right? For your main. Yeah, I, I use Fedora mainly, but I, I do have Windows in this instance because of Java. And it's just because it's, if you've ever dealt with like Java dependencies and all that stuff, I just, I, I don't want to deal with it. So it's easier in Windows and a VM that I can just burn. Yeah. Uh, Dimitri, uh, OpenShift was a great tectonic alternative. Um, just Kubernetes from, I mean, aren't they all? Uh, I think K3S is more evolutional than OpenShift. Um, I would say that they target different use cases, different perspectives. Um, yeah, to JB Pratt's point, they solve different problems. Um, so OpenShift is Kubernetes. Like literally, when you deploy OpenShift, right? O OpenShift um, is is built upon Kubernetes. What makes it OpenShift is Red Hat takes the kind of full stack of things. So the operating system is RHEL CoreOS, which is a, a flavor, if you will, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And then we deploy Kubernetes on top of that. And then we deploy Operator Lifecycle Manager and install all of the things that make OpenShift into OpenShift, which is really like a set of add-on services capabilities, right? Built on top of Kubernetes. So think, you know, the admin console, right? It's just a service, just a set of pods that's running an OpenShift. Um, the ability to manage the nodes, you know, from within the cluster itself is machine config operator, right? To, deployed on top of that Kubernetes cluster itself. So K3S is really, really interesting um, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is it's ultra lightweight, right? It's really good at managing, you know, with the bare minimum amount of stuff in place, the ability to deploy Kubernetes-based applications. Um, so within the Red Hat portfolio, we're working on a thing called MicroShift. Um, is that right, Johnny? Yeah, yep. I, th I think they're working on a, on a better name for it than MicroShift, but similar concept of being able to deploy, um, basically you, you get to choose the um, operating system that you deploy, and then you deploy MicroShift on top of it, and it provides that OpenShift Kubernetes API on top um, with only the services that you need. And many, uh, it's still RHEL. So CoreOS is RHEL, yep. and RHEL is Core. Yeah, so it's it's all built on the same. Yeah. yeah, so so way back when, um, so what, what, four years ago, five years ago, Red Hat bought a company called CoreOS. CoreOS had a Linux distribution named ContainerOS and a management interface for Kubernetes called Tectonic. So when Red Hat brought, and at the time, Red Hat had OpenShift 3, which, was, which used RHEL 6, I think at the time, maybe 7, um, as the underlying operating system. And um, we had the OpenShift admin console and all that. So, uh, oh, and Atomic Limit, Linux, right? We also had mm -hmm. Atomic Atomic Linux. Uh, so when we bought CoreOS, we basically took all of the really cool things that they were doing with Tectonic and Container Linux um, and merged them together. And so Tectonic became a part of the OpenShift console. Container Linux and Atomic basically merged together to create what is today Red Hat Enterprise Linux CoreOS. Uh, so it is a RHEL kernel in RHEL packages, but it's packaged up and used using RPM OS tree and with many of the management tools that came from Container Linux and CoreOS. So um, 
Johnny, I know we're running um, kind of long today. I feel like I've been running my mouth a lot. So, um, no, man, it's all good. Yeah. So, uh, do you? I don't know how much time you've got left. Well, yeah. So I'm, I was just waiting on this node to finish, and then, um, yeah, basically, like, if you want, we can punt until like next week, or we can do it as part of the blog for the the UPI part. But it's up to you because I I just I have to bounce like here in the next like few minutes. Okay. Yeah. So. Um... Let's uh let, let's push off um because so the the last thing that you were going to show is how to do a how to manually provision a worker node and join it to an IPI cluster so yep um let's do a blog post we we can record that um I think I mentioned last week maybe we maybe we could do a short or something like that I've been talking with our marketing folks you know I, last week or was it the week before whenever time ball blends together when I was with the marketing folks we were talking about different different things that we can do so maybe we can do something like that if we can find time but um. Yeah, and and I know we don't always have time to run super late. Um, let's see, just reading through comics or comments here, rather. Um, Dimitri, so get a ready use infrastructure and it costs money. Um, yes and no. So remember, everything Red Hat does is open source. Uh, so the upstream for OpenShift would be OKD. Uh, you can absolutely use OKD, and it is. Uh, as I said earlier, like 99% the same, right? Things like branding and all of that's going to be this going to be different. Um, so it won't say Red Hat OpenShift in the corner. It'll say OKD. Um, but of course, you don't get support. Um, so if you're familiar with how CentOS operates now, right, it is always moving forward, um, that type of stuff. OKD is the same. And we can have a lengthy conversation about that someday. Um but yeah, if you uh, if you do choose to use OpenShift, just like with all Red Hat products, right? You're you're paying for support, and you're paying for all of the all of the things that we do. Um, there's a great um, if you search for uh, Red Hat, the value of a, a subscription. Like there's a, a way better than I could ever do, you know, set of things that explain exactly what Red Hat does and the value prop and all that. Um, I'm in the BU. I'm not a salesperson. Um, let's see. Red Hat becomes a part of IBM. Fedora Silver Blue user, nice. So RPM OS three. Um, yep, that's if essentially or exactly what happens with uh, CoreOS, um, Rel yep. CoreOS underneath the covers. So if you were to look inside of an an OpenShift cluster or an OKD cluster, the way that it does operating system updates is it just pushes out a whole new RPM OS tree layer and then activates it. Uh, in the future, and one of the future shows that we've got planned is thing is a thing called CoreOS layering. So you'll be able to customize your own CoreOS to add packages, drivers, etc. Um, so same exact principle, right? You'll you'll uh, be able to deploy and update that uh, those rel CoreOS nodes using RPM OS tree. Or, or yeah, RPM that's gonna be huge. That's, yeah, that's I'm huge. I'm excited to get those guys on. I, did I share yeah. with you the the slide presentation that they shared with me? Yeah. There's uh -huh. some really cool stuff. I'll share that with you. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, WireGuard server support. Um, I don't know. That's a good... Um, sorry, WireGuard. Uh, I know we're talking about OpenShift. So usually that makes me think of... I think it's Calico offers the ability to do WireGuard in between nodes. I don't remember. One of the SDNs offers that. All right. Uh, I know you got to go. Kids and all that other stuff, Johnny. Yep, I just wanted to quickly show, like when the when the node checks in to the console, this is what you see. But the reason why I have insufficient here is because it it's just AT and T Uverse doesn't allow me to delegate DNS or do anything funky with DNS, so it's a pain. But anyways, um, if if I had my DNS set up correctly, then this would just work, and then I would just click install ready host, and then essentially approve some CSRs, and then it's all done. Very cool. Yeah, it, it's um. The, the big change is just using assisted installer. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you probably could get it to work in the traditional way, but why? Assisted installer makes it so much easier. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna cheat and like pull the boot ISO down and then do it that way, but then I was like, why yeah. make life hard on yourself, Johnny? Yeah, yeah. I know. All right. Well, thank you, Johnny. I appreciate your uh, your efforts and getting all that stuff set up. Sorry, we didn't get to the second part. Um, be able to show all the work that you put in there but like i said we'll, we'll make a recording of it we'll figure out something um even if we steal some time from next week uh so thank you to everyone who has joined us today we really appreciate your time and attention um 
thank you for everybody who's been chatting. We love chat. We love to answer questions. That's the whole reason we're here. So uh, thank you for the folks who are here live. If you're not watching us live, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, or if you want to follow up with us and, and have conversations about anything that we were talking about here um, offline, um, you're welcome to reach out. So you can reach me at Practical Andrew on like Twitter, uh, on Reddit, on all of the various places. Uh, you can also reach me via email, andrew.sullivan at redhead.com. Uh, and of course, I always encourage, encourage folks to go to the OpenShift users um, Kubernetes channel. Kubernetes mm -hmm. team? Yeah. Channel on the Kubernetes team. Channel, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think of Slack terminology here. They're all different. Um, Johnny, do you have a link to that by chance? Do you have a uh, not offhand, off but I, I will really quickly. Just one sec. Uh, copy, copy link. Ha ha. I got it. Got it? Okay. All right, I'll post this into Twitch so it'll get propagated out. Uh, so there's the uh, the link to that Kubernetes channel if you want to chat in there. Uh, throwing Johnny under the bus, you can also reach out to Johnny as well at jrocktx1 because he's in Texas. Um, and Or Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y at redhat.com. So thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your time. Uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out at any time. Tons of stuff going on in the, in the upcoming weeks. So if you're not subscribed to the channel already, um, definitely encourage you to do that. Um, you can also go to red.ht slash live stream. I'll put that into this chat. Uh, so if you go to that link, that brings you to the landing page for Red Hat live streaming, including a link to our streaming calendar, uh, as our Hope 9 called us out on earlier. We'll do a better job about updating what the topics are, but you'll at least have reminders uh, of when we're going live and stuff like that. So... Have a great week, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, catching up with us. And Johnny, I'll leave you with last words. Yeah, man. Thanks for everything. Uh, it's an awesome week. I'm looking forward to the next you know, few weeks. Uh, I talked to Dean from VMware, so uh, we'll, we'll get him on as well. So um, nice. yeah, we got a lot of good things coming up. So looking forward to it. Nice. Uh oh, Johnny, I forgot what we're supposed to do. We got to click something. Right, I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sitting here staring at you in the